Hello again, welcome to my presentation, Using Metrics to Drive Product Success. Uh, before we dive into the topic, I would like to briefly introduce myself so you know why I'm interested in this topic. My background is engineering. I got my bachelor degree here in Serbia and my master's in Vancouver, Canada. So in engineering, you learn a lot about measuring and metrics and things like that. And uh, after graduating, I worked as a developer both for startups and corporations. Uh, and once again, I found use for use of metrics, but the story is a bit different with uh, my experience working as a product manager, a product coach, and that's what I'm going to share uh, today with you. I work for both startups and big corporations and even as a product coach to new, uh, to new colleagues. So here are my reasons why we are talking about the metrics today. Uh, my, my firm belief is that you cannot develop a successful product without using metrics to some extent. Um, and but at the same time, my experience tells me that many use the wrong metrics to follow the, the development of their product. And finally, uh, why I see this interesting, even though th th this is important topic for all of us, uh, I don't see it enough discussed in our product community. So I would like to start talking about that and not only at this venue, but later, uh, uh, if you have some comments or questions, I would be really happy to, to hear because as I said, yeah, I find it really important for us. Uh, my goals for today, given the short time that we have, is to introduce the basic com concept. Uh, nevertheless, even with that, if we increase the chance of success of your products significantly. Uh, the, the other part that I would like to share are examples from my own experience building real uh, life products and my experience with metrics there. A reason for that is that I find metrics really a uh, uh, practical topic and also I think that the best way to learn new things is to examining other people's mistakes. So I hope that will help and at the end uh, my goal for this one uh, would be that you can finish this uh, presentation and have some skills that will help you uh, start implementing metrics if you haven't or improve metrics on your own products. So let's start with the as a golden war stories, uh, uh, there will be a couple of them. Um, so the first one, uh, I um, on purpose I made them really anonymous. So I'm not talking about companies; it's not important. It's more about uh, what happened. So the first one, it's I would say a typical one: developing a software library. Uh, it's a, a bit technical term, but basically it's a part of a software used by many other uh, uh, developers. And the company doing that was digital advertising platform. Think of about as a, uh, the all the ads that you see on common websites like news websites. So uh, the company was developing a platform for serving those ads on uh, uh, different websites. Uh, they were competing with Google and Facebook in Facebook in the Netherlands. So they were one of the biggest players there, and they wanted to enter the mobile market at the time which was a new platform. Uh, they allocated, I would say, a significant budget. Uh, I cannot go into details, but definitely more than $1 million euros. Uh, so all in all, let's see how that uh, product went. Uh, here are a couple of uh, facts uh, about it and metrics that we use. So let's try to assess together the success of this product. The first one, um, luckily for us, sometimes uh, when developing new products, uh, it, we don't have a clear requirements, but this time there was an industry standard created by big players in the industry, like Google, Microsoft, Adobe, uh, that defined the common standard for serving uh, digital ads. So we had a pretty clear goal. Uh, the product uh, itself was delivered on time and budget. So that was, that was good. And at the same time, uh, we were one of the first companies to market. So there were not many other implementations of the product. And the part that we were really proud of was that we implemented um, a complete 
uh, set of features. So even more features than uh, Google had at that time. So we supported many different types of ads for mobile applications. So my question would be, uh, was that a successful product or not? Um, because we can do a show of hands, maybe you can post uh, yes or no in the comments or just think for yourself, what do you, uh, do you have enough information to make this conclusion? Um, the part that I didn't tell you, that uh, the product was never used. So no matter that it was developed on time, uh, according to specification, on budget and time, it was never used. So that was definitely not a successful product. So what we can conclude about the metrics that we use in product itself is that the goal was reached. Uh, we developed the, the library, but we do, did that in a project mode, not as a product mode. So, uh, and all the metrics that we tracked were uh, delivery metrics. So most important for us was the uh, output created uh, piece of software, but not the outcome, how that was received by the market. So um, that was a big learning for me at that time, uh, that even though it's, uh, on the surface you created a successful product uh, or you did everything right, that might not be a successful product. So the first lesson here is that, as you probably know, project is not a product. Hence, you should not follow the same kind of metrics and same kind of approach uh, that, that would work for a project. Uh, let's jump to another example. So product number two was a marketplace. So the story uh, goes as follows. A big corporation had a dominant player in one market. So in one country, they had a, a, a monopoly and they decided to expand to another markets by buying smaller players in those other markets. And they, they were, their goal was to replicate the same success on those markets. So far so good. They have definitely, they had definite experience. Uh, so uh, the idea was to, to uh, do the same on different markets. And uh, the size was even bigger than the previous one. There were more than 100 people, more than 10 teams uh, working on product on three continents in several countries. So when you look into that, uh, what was set as a goal, uh, the product goal given to us was that we should migrate all the existing customers by the end of the July of, the, of that year. So all the, uh, all the existing users should be moved to a new uh, unified solution. Uh, uh, in all the countries. So here is the graph of how that uh, implementation went. So we start in February when we just start rolling out the product. And over the time, by the end of July, we had all the customers on the new product. Um, my question would be the same like in the previous example. Was this a successful product or not? So right now we know that people are using it. So it's not the same mistake. But was this a successful product? Um, maybe just a different thing, but uh, the same problem. It's uh, users didn't have a choice. They had to switch to a new system. So once again, that was output, not the outcome. We didn't follow, we didn't track the product and business metrics like have we. Uh, increased user satisfaction? Did we increase the revenue? Uh, is the product easier to maintain? All those goals that are actually important when you are launching a new version uh, were not, are not presented here. So it's hard to say, was it uh, successful or not just by judging the number of users using a new product? Um, I think that I saw somebody unmuting. So if you have questions, please go. Uh, I'll be happy to yes, no, no, thanks for that, but it's here. My question was, when you show this uh, graph before, actually, first on my mind was, um, is there any information about number of the new customers they have landed to this platform? But um, it, if, if 
there will be a time you can answer that. Uh, so, yes, great question, because actually that was something that we should have followed, but uh, the goal was set just to uh, 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 transition customers migrate from one to another platform. And uh, because the system was big, we didn't have a real time information about the new customers. So yes, that would be my, my suggestion in this time, in this case, not just to follow like also how many people have the system, because if you follow only percentages, it's hard to say if we, uh, is this 100 the same number like before we introduce the system? So yeah, that would be one of the things and uh, that's the clear the, the way that we should think about the product. Um, and yeah, we, we can discuss dark, dark tanks uh, at the end, like maybe there are other metrics that we could have used. Um, all right. Uh, maybe I started with uh, examples of how not to use metrics. Let's start with an example like uh, the metrics were used more successfully. So this will be a, a, a common type of situation for a software as a service. You have a product that has its own landing page and you're asking uh, customers to try it uh, you're offering a free trial and you're asking them to try it before they become uh, uh, paying customers. Um, so that, that was the goal uh, of many companies. So in this case, uh, we had an onboarding sequence sign up flow that consisted of three steps. Uh, so the steps are following as many SaaS products. We had different plans. So we will ask clients to, or potential clients to select the plan then to fill in the basic information about their, so that's a business to business, that was a business to business product. So they need to enter the name of the company, uh, contact information, and as a third step, uh, they, they had to invite their colleagues, uh, at least some of them to try out the, try the product. So the, the goal that we had was, okay, we have this flow, but is there a way to increase the number of signups? Can we do something about the signup flow that will increase the number of signups? And we came up with one assumption that uh, maybe we are scaring off users by asking them to, uh, to select the plan upfront. Maybe if we said, had that as a third option, maybe that will increase the signup. So first enter information, then invite colleagues and then select the plan. All right, now we have two versions. Uh, if you had to choose one, uh, once again, an experiment for you, or if you want, you can comment, which one would you choose, A or B? Uh, but please be aware, I will ask you why, why you chose A or B uh, at the time. Okay, we have some. Okay. So I have one A here. You maybe want to post A and B and then people should like. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to do that. What do you mean post A and B? I can do it. Oh, okay. Like this and then uh, whichever one you prefer, um, hit the like button. I know it's easier with a show of hands, but we'll just let's think a bit. So most of the people, or at least A is leading right now. Uh, there is one B, but um, the, the main question is, okay, why we are doing those assumptions? There is one, Antonia said, uh, I would like to know what to expect in the beginning. Okay, that's a fair assumption. But if I ask you a different question, if there is a third option, uh, what would you, what would that be uh, if you, if you had a third option, like we had this A, B, and is there a third option to choose? <clears throat> and I will give you just one small hint. It's please remember the, the title of, the, of this talk, using metrics. Um, and at this point, moment, I think it's important to think like uh, 
even if you choose A or B, you you made that decision or that choice based on some assumptions. Uh, and the whole idea of the using metrics or the main, the main idea was to test your assumption. So uh, that, that process happens kind of uh, instantaneously for all of us. We, we usually create those opinions based on our previous experience or knowledge or something like that. Sometimes we're not even aware that we are making a uh, choice based on assumption. But as a product manager, I think that we should, in these cases, stop, think of it, and define those assumptions first and test them. So uh, that will be the rest of this talk. And I will explain on this example how we use testing of assumptions to find uh, the best solution. So instead of us discussing A or B or um, yeah, debating that, we could test that. So let's start with the basics of the of the uh, idea of using metrics. So uh, with, when I say let's test our assumptions, we should think like scientists. Uh, thinking and like here is under quotes, just because we don't need to follow it completely the scientific method, but uh, we can draw many conclusions from from it or use uh, many useful parts of it. Uh, basically, uh, I'm pretty sure you all heard for this quote that if you cannot measure something, you cannot improve it. Uh, actually, I'm not 100% uh, who, 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 was the, uh, who was the person behind this quote, but the chat GPT gave me this answer, so please blame, blame it. Uh, and if you think about the scientific method, uh, we can simplify it into this graph. We have observation of nature or our surrounding. We create a hypothesis. And in order to confirm or uh, 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 prove this hypothesis, we do an experiment. That's the basis of scientific method. We then analyze our experiment and see if that fits our hypothesis. If yes, then uh, we are good for now. We, we, we should continue trying to find a, a way how to approve it or disapprove it. But if not, then we need to, uh, we need to uh, correct our hypothesis. So basically, the experiment is the key for us to uh, find uh, the truth in our hypothesis. The same approach uh, was started to use for uh, startups. And uh, the similar approach was uh, popularized by a book, The Lean Startup, by Eric Ries, uh, by different names, but the idea is pretty much the simple, uh, the same. Uh, we start, they, they call it build, measure, learn cycle, where we build something, we measure the impact of that uh, product uh, to the market, and we learn something. Either we kind of uh, continue in that direction, or we uh, we need to find another approach to reach our goal. So the idea is the same, but the, the question for us on the example that I showed, it's how to test our assumption. So you heard definitely for uh, MEP uh, in this context, which means the minimum viable product. So should we build the MVP uh, to find out if our assumptions are correct? And I like the approach uh, proposed by many authors in, in the field that we don't need the product or better said, we don't need the product, we need a prototype. So the P in MVP should be a prototype. Uh, I mean, it's a slight difference, it, it, it's, but for me, it makes sense because then uh, product seems like something that we can, uh, uh, it's final and then we can sell it to, to many customers. But with prototype, we are kind of a more cautious, more humble, and we are testing our hypothesis and trying to see if they are true or not. Uh, so in case of, uh, uh, for our purposes, we can break down the testing of assumptions in following steps. Define the problem, create an assumption or assumptions, uh, set the goal, okay, what we are trying to achieve, and choose the metrics. So metrics and goal are definitely related because we will say, okay, we want to increase the number of users. 
we want to decrease churn, we want to increase revenue, we want to whatever it's important for your product. And then you specify the really concrete goal, like I want to decrease churn by 20%, I want to increase the number of users by 30%, I want to decrease the uh, cost by 15%. So all those things should be clear for you for you when you start developing a new thing. Uh, what is the problem? And what is the assumption that I'm trying to solve? And by solving it, or implementing it, uh, what I'm going to achieve. Finally, the final test is to test that assumption and to go through that process until you reach your goal or move to another assumptions. In this case, we had uh, two options, A and B, and the option C that I proposed is to test your assumptions. So basically you heard for that already, that's A, B test where you're testing both uh, both solutions and trying to find out which one worked better. So let's see. The problem is not enough subscribers, or we want to increase the number of subscri subscribers. The assumption is we are asking for the money too soon. So basically, uh, maybe the majority of users uh, want to see what they are, uh, uh, what we are selling before they uh, choose the the right plan. Goal and metric are, in this case, the metric it's known as a conversion rate. So the rate by which we are converting visitors to uh, customers, and we want to increase that rate by 10%. Uh, and we then test both versions. And that's why it's called, as I mentioned, A-B test, where we can see which one of these uh, are working better. So just to confirm your product sense, uh, the version A worked better. But still, that, that shouldn't prevent you or stop you from testing both versions because sometimes unexpected things happen. Uh, maybe then the next step that is important for you, all right, we have a problem. We have some assumptions, but is there a better way to create assumptions and to uh, choose uh, the most important assumptions? The approach that I would uh, recommend, it's using quantitative and qualitative analytics. Basically, we want to analyze our, uh, our problem space uh, to understand our users, their problems, how they're using product. And in order to do that, we have two approaches. Quantitative, uh, we are measuring what, what is happening in the system right now. Uh, that describes the current data, uh, the current state, and it's based on experiment and measurement. So, how many users it's going through the sign up flow right now? Uh, do we have better and worse days? Is it better on Tuesday than on Sunday or the other way around? Uh, so we are analyzing the data that we have in the system. But the important part about the quantitative analysis that can rarely give us information why things happen. Uh, it will tell us uh, what happens, but the qualitative analysis will answer our question why things are happening. And basically that means talking to the users. So we need to combine both of those approaches to create our assumptions. So we see what's happening in the system. We create some assumptions maybe on the first version of assumptions. And then we are talking to users and asking them uh, to explain why they did something. And based on all of that, we are, we are creating hypotheses or assumptions. So current state plus, plus talk, talking to users, and then we use uh, quantitative metrics to test it, like in case of A-B test. All right. Uh, now we talked about assumptions, how to choose metrics. Uh, the, the question that I found was, what makes a good metric? And the answer I found in this great book, Lean Analytics. So if I, I, I'm, I mentioned already a couple of books, I mentioned a couple of more. But if I would need to choose one that I would recommend for you to read, if you want to learn more about analytics, that will definitely be this one, Lean Analytics. And the, their answer to a good metric is that metric should confirm or disapprove your assumption. So if metric does not do that, then it's not useful. So once again, we are starting with assumption and we should find a metric that should say, that should give an answer to us, uh, is that assumption? True or not? Uh, 
characteristics of a good metric is that it's actionable. So as we said, change is the way that you behave. And good way to spot those metrics is that they're comparative. They give direction. Are we doing better or worse than before? So uh, increase, so absolute number, it's all right. But at the same time, relative number, it's better for a look. So that's why we are using percentages, like increase the number of users by 10 or 20%, because uh, absolute number can sometimes be misleading. Uh, the other way to compare metrics are actual vanity metrics. Vanity metrics is just that the other way to say that the metric itself will not uh, push us in any direction or approve or disapprove uh, uh, our hypothesis. And how to spot vanity metrics? They are often cumulative. So total number of users, downloads, page, page, page visits. So uh, the problem with those metrics is that over the time, the total number of users will only rise. Uh, but the question is, is it rising fast enough? Or uh, do we use uh, how many of those users are using the, uh, our services right now? And so on and on. So once again, metrics should approve or disapprove your hypothesis. And as I mentioned, actionable metrics uh, are of the ratio rate. So average revenue per users, the increase of number of active users per week. So each week we can see if you're doing better or worse than the previous week, and if you are moving toward uh, the goal that we set. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, another way to look at the metrics is this a bit silly example. Let's assume that we are following the ice cream sales uh, on this continent because it's different on different continents and hemispheres actually. And then we can see the rise of this uh, uh, that starts, let's say in April and that we have a peak in August and slowly after that we have the decline in the sales. So nothing surprising here. Uh, let's assume that we compare this with the shark attacks. Uh, fortunately, not in this country, but we would see the similar pattern that uh, the, the graphs for ice cream sales and shark attacks are behaving pretty similarly. So what we can conclude from these two, uh, I'm pretty sure that you will guess, uh, is there a, a relationship between these two? Yes. Uh, there are two ways to define relationship. One is correlation, the other is causation. Correlation, two events have similar trends. Uh, and the reason for that, probably there is uh, some root cause that influences both of them. And I'm pretty sure that you can guess what it is for the sharks and ice cream. Uh, more interesting for us, it's causation, that one event causes another event. So uh, as you'll explain in next slides, this is what we are after in product management usually, because uh, we want to know the root cause what, what is controlling events. So with correlation, we have prediction. So if we see the increase in the uh, ice cream sales, we can expect this increase in the uh, shark attacks. But if we know what causing a, uh, a phenomenon or like, event, then we have control over it. So once again, what will be the control parameter in the, in the case of ice creams and shark attacks? All right. So that will be temperature, of course. So increase in temperature will uh, lead to the increase in, uh, uh, well, in number of people that are eating ice creams, and that leads to higher sales. Once again, I know this sounds silly, but introduce an, an important concept. Uh, temperature here is a leading metric. So that's something that we can measure uh, on a short time scale and see and follow their changes. Uh, but uh, sales are lagging metric. Sometimes you won't know that sales change until you get all your results from the, uh, from the field after weeks or months. So for you, it's important as a product manager to establish uh, what, are the, um, what are the leading and lagging metrics in your system. And also, uh, 
what kind of behavior change on your users uh, the leading metric will have. So in this case, if you can increase, increase temperature, we can change the behavior of people, then they will consume more ice cream, which will lead to your business business goal of selling more ice cream. So that's all sounds good. And, um, but we can use that in a more, uh, in example that it's maybe more related to your own work. Uh, but before we go there, let's, def let's just mention that each of these metrics or affect have a different uh, uh, metric. So temperature we are measuring Celsius, but sales we are measuring uh, money. So uh, that, that's also just a caution uh, idea. Uh, so th to sum it up, we have two layers in our system. Leading metrics, or something sometimes called indicators, they describe user behavior. If you can control them, uh, you can change the behavior of users. So in this case, unless you believe in a, a conspiracy theory, uh, it's not so easy to change the daily temperature, but in your system, you might be able to change some things that will change user behavior. And as a result, you're targeting your lagging metrics uh, and your main goal. So money in this case. Let's apply this on a case of a music streaming service. Uh, by music streaming service, I think like Spotify or Deezer. So I'm pretty sure that you know uh, that you're familiar with one of them. And let's assume that you're a product manager on that product and that your goal for your team is to decrease churn. Churn is the number of users that stop using your product. And uh, if you don't know, that's one of the most important uh, uh, SaaS metrics because that can either make you really successful if your churn is low or kill your product pretty soon, or really fast if your churn is high. Uh, let's break down this using the framework that we proposed at the beginning. So the problem is uh, a certain amount of users uh, is stopping using your solution. Uh, the first part that you want to establish is uh, for your problem is a baseline, where we are right now. To do that, we need the quantitative, remember quantitative metrics, the current state. So we can measure that and know what is the, what's the trade right now. You can create an assumption. Uh, to create an assumption, you use qualitative metrics. You talk to users and ask, especially those that left your product or that they're uh, not using it. So what's the reason that they're leaving the product? And then you create a new assumption based on quantitative and qualitative metrics. You set the goal and metrics. So metrics here are leading uh, and lagging. It's the uh, your goal of uh, achieving the lower churn. So let's put the numbers to this example. Yeah, and finally, of course, test your assumption. So uh, let's assume that your current churn is five percent of users. That doesn't seem too bad, but that means that you will lose. 60% uh, of user, users on a course of one year, which is really high. Uh, to set the goal, uh, I, uh, we don't go, we won't go into details of that, uh, but um, the good way to think about it, to follow the industry standards, some of them are mentioned in the book, the Lean Analytics. So depending on your industry and the uh, type of product that you are developing, you will try to find uh, uh, what is the good goal for you? So with the two percent, you're you're doing good, and so this is what we are uh, what we are aiming for. Okay, what is our assumption? Uh, so yeah, what is our assumption? The there will be as as, as I mentioned two layers of assumptions. The first uh, assumption that users are not using the service is enough. So that's what they told you. So there is no value for me in this product, so I'm not going to use it enough. But that's just the first layer. You need to dig deeper. Uh, and when you ask them, okay, uh, why the why why you're not using our service? Why does there's, there's, there's no value for you? They will, for example, tell you, okay, there is no enough local music music that will um, that I would like to hear. 
So then you create another level of assumption saying that, okay, if we introduce local music, uh, that will make users to use product more and that will uh, increase uh, perceived value for them of our services. So the metrics for primary uh, goal is churn, like how many users leave that, but we can control that by the measuring uh, uh, the average usage of our services uh, on a daily basis. Why is that important? You can easily see that average usage you can, as I mentioned, you can measure each day and see how they changes, but with the churn, you wait at least a month or two to see if people are uh, continuing their subscription, and especially if they leave, then it's hard to uh, persuade them to get back to the platform. And let's draw the same diagram that we did for uh, ice cream and sharks. So the leading metric here is new music that we introduced. The behavior change that we are trying to achieve is that we will increase the listening time. And the next assumption uh, I, would, I would like you to please know there are two assumptions here. If you introduce new music, people will listen it more. So that's an assumption. But also an assumption, even though it sounds logical, but it's still an assumption, is that if they listen more, uh, they will they will not leave our platform as as much as before. So leading metric, it's a. Uh, New music and lagging, it's a churn, like uh, uh, how many people play the platform. So, the other way to represent this relationship is to uh, put uh, to create a graph with our goals, our assumptions, and our proposed solutions. So, our main goal is to increase revenue. In order to increase revenue, we need to decrease churn. That's directly related. So decreasing churn will uh, increase revenue. In order to decrease churn, we want to increase listening time. All right, so that's a lagging metric because as we said, it will take some time. But if you introduce new music, that should increase listening time. So that's something that we could uh, measure on a daily basis. Uh, so this sounds all right. Uh, and as I mentioned, I would like you to uh, think of how to use metrics on your daily basis. And if, you, if you're not using it already, at least you heard about the OKRs, which are objective, objectives and key results. And uh, let's wrap this all together, like how we're going to use metrics that we discussed in setting our goals and measuring our pro uh, uh, progress of our product. So, Objective and key results is just a short history. Uh, objectives are basically the other name for goals. Key results, important part, measurable milestones. Uh, and exactly this is the where many companies are not implementing OKRs right. They set the milestones as something that is not measurable or that it's measurable like uh, we implement or we didn't implement a new feature. So that's uh, kind of a black and white on and off. While the Key results should be, as we said uh, before, for metrics, something that it's a ratio or uh, some actionable metrics. Uh, they were introduced by Andrew Grove, CEO of Intel, but they really became popular with, uh, with Google uh, that implemented them. And uh, you can find many talks about, oh, here are so many companies uh, trying to uh, reproduce or replicate Google's success day. Uh, start using OKRs. Uh, if you look at, the, at our own example from, from previous uh, slide about music streaming, uh, we can separate that in the OKRs, looking at each step or each layer individually. So if the main goal of the company is to increase the revenue by 20%, we can do that in many different ways. So let's assume that we can increase revenue per listener, we can decrease the churn or we cut the cost. So for each of those, we assign metric. Uh, there can be more, but this is uh, just one of those examples. And uh, I just want to emphasize that there is more goals and different teams can attack different goals. So we can set our OKRs 
uh, in that way that OKR on the main level, it's, uh, as we said, revenue increased by 20% and then key results on the lower level levels. The important part is that we can repeat the same process for each level. Each of the key results of one level can, became, can become um, objective for next level. So if you want to do the decrease churn, we can do that in different ways. So let's assume that we can increase listening time and improve satisfaction. So once again, we can split that in a smaller goals uh, that individual teams can attack. And in that case, uh, we have a new set of objective and key results. Now the objective is it's a key result from a previous uh, layer, decrease churn, and then we have key results um, on this layer. And for completeness, one more time, I mean, depending on the complexity of your product and size of your organization, you can break that down in many layers. So increasing listening time, we can do that by offering new music, build better recommendation system, or for example, offer a new uh, product like podcast. And for each of them, we can assign uh, some goals and some different metrics how to, how to track them. And once again, now the objective is listening, increasing listening time, and key results are given for each of these solutions. So for me, that's a good way to think about metrics. And even, even if, though if you don't have objectives set in that way, you can always work backwards in your system. And even if your uh, goal is, okay, we want to implement feature like, or we want to in, improve recommendation algorithm, if that's your goal, you can always go backward and say, if we include, increase recommendation by 15%, you can also track the listening time. So nobody prevents you in your company, hopefully, uh, to uh, propose those metrics and to start following. And I think that nice things will happen. So in summary, I would just like to briefly go through the ideas and to uh, summarize how to start using metrics. So, and whose job is that? So what I see is that a person responsible for metrics is a product manager, but it's not solely a work of a product manager. That's something that should be discussed with the whole team uh, so that everybody has the same understanding of the problem that, that we are trying to solve together and then also defining metrics. Uh, developers should be able to implement tracking in code. There are many already uh, uh, solution in place that can help you with that. You don't need to start from scratch. There are uh, products that you can easily implement. And then depending on the size of the company, you have a data analyst or somebody in the team that plays that role that will create reports. Uh, for example, in, as in this case, like uh, how the listening time changes uh, when we introduce new things in our, in our product. Uh, summary. I would recommend to start small, even if you don't have much uh, implemented already, if you don't have many metrics implemented, you can start just in one part. You don't need to do that uh, for the whole product. Uh, I would advise of using existing tools, no need to create your own analytics engine or something like that. And as we said for a scientific method, uh, you, you need to do that iteratively. Track experiment and one maybe thought that uh, was important for me when I started implementing is that uh, most probably you won't do it right in the first try. So test your reports as well. So if you find out some results that are really good or really bad, um, be suspicious and please double check because sometimes even bad or good results are a result of a measuring error, not the real behavior of your system. So that will be all. I would like to thank you and I'll open a chat and or you can please uh, ask your questions directly here like Darko did. So let me see. Uh, I will go. Um, yes, if anyone yeah. has any questions, please post them in the comment section or just ask them directly. Uh, and I also have another feedback form for you uh, today. So 
uh, please feel free to, to fill in um, your impressions of Nenon's lecture. Okay, today. so Yellen asked about the best existing platforms tools. So there are several, uh, depending on the type of your product. But first of all, uh, you, go, you have Google Analytics that will help uh, uh, add analytics to your websites. That, that's one, one way. Uh, the other two popular tools are, um, oh, just a sec. Um, oh, <laughs> I lost my track of thought. Just, just give me a sec. Mix panel and amplitude. So uh, there are many more. They are not too expensive to start uh, playing with. You can try different ones, but they all work in a similar way. Uh, but please, please involve uh, your own technical teams because it's really important to uh, to consult with them and see, uh, for example, are you tracking things on front end and back end? There are so many still things to think of. But once again, for a uh, investment of a couple of days, a couple of weeks, you you will have great results. Um, Olga, so thank you. Uh, anyone else? Okay, Dan had a good question. Okay, I'll read them in case you don't you don't see them. So uh, from the things you remember, the steps and process, defining problems, setting goals, choosing metrics, uh, what your companies are most bad at. So I would say that the first thing is that people don't even start using metrics. So uh, maybe you have different experience. Uh, if this was a live presentation, I will, I will ask for a show of hands how many of you are using metrics in your daily work. So uh, so just that, but if you start doing that, even if you're doing that in a way wrongly, you will improve over time. Uh, it's such, I haven't seen a company that started using metrics to one extent or another that was not happy with that or curious. Once you present to the rest of the team or a company, oh, we measured something and here are the results, please just see their, their eyes. They will, you know, <laughs> they will be really interested to hear more. So please try to find a way to uh, to start playing with that, and you know, great things will happen. Uh, Yelena, um, yeah, how... we have mm -hmm. another question. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you decide whether to follow pirate or hard metrics? Uh, what are the pros and cons for both metric uh, frameworks? All right, I know pirate metric. Yelena, can you please explain hard? Maybe I heard it and forgot it. Uh, Pirate metrics are R metrics uh, defined by David McClure, but for Hart, I'm not sure. Can you please explain? Uh, so I'll try to explain to the rest at least Pirate that I know. So that's a five process step uh, that David McClure proposed to follow. Uh, uh, development of a startup, basically, yeah, thank you. So uh, you follow the steps of a user to your system, like acquisition, uh, like uh, like I mentioned with the sign-up flow. Uh, what is the conversion rate from the people that haven't heard about your product until they become your users? And then one day, once they become your users, you follow uh, either help you spread the word more if that's the kind of product that you're building usually for the B2C product. Uh, for heart, okay, heart is happiness, engagement, adoption, attention, thus success. Uh, I don't know much about it. Oh, actually, I don't know anything. So to me, it seems really similar and I don't have an answer, but once again, I would just say, whichever you use or you want to use, start with one and you know, experiment. So that's that would be more. Sorry that I, I couldn't give you more precise answer. Johanna? No, it's it's okay. I, it's easier for me to engage like this than to type. To be honest, if that's yeah, okay. same. Yeah. So um, I I was also using R and uh, I didn't have much information about the uh, the user satisfaction. So I came across this framework. Mm -hmm. 
which worked really well in that area. Right. And uh, I found that our approach uh, usually, it, it was good during that freemium time of, mm -hmm. of the product, but it didn't really measure and didn't really tell anything about the, the user satisfaction. But yeah. uh, I also read that this heart approach, um, you should be really careful when using it because uh, uh, sometimes user satisfaction is not the thing that is the most important for the, the product to be successful. And it, it really depends on the product. It, it's, um, I mean, it's like a harsh truth to say <laughs> that sometimes, you know, not users that are not satisfied, uh, that's not always good, of course, but uh, it really depends on the, the goal you, you, you're trying to achieve. So, yep. so I, I was just curious about if you have used Thanks. It. I would agree. In my experience, maybe not directly about the heart metrics, but about measuring user satisfaction. Uh, for me, it's a bit vague and it's hard to measure. Uh, I, in my experience, we achieve better results than measuring the uh, hard metrics like conversion and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's important mm -hmm. to know uh, uh, what prevented users from using the product. Are they happy or not? Of course, all of that. Uh, but uh, for example, we didn't have a good um, participation in those uh, surveys that we sent about um, like how happy you are with the product would you recommend this product to other people and things like that but with the conversion you basically cover all of your users so you have the hard data the, to make decisions uh, i'm not saying that happiness is not important and uh, uh, user satisfaction but once again my experience that is it was a bit harder to track and to make it measurable yeah, it really is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.